Envision Jesus asking his question of his disciples with maybe a little bit of playfulness in his eyes. Maybe tested Philip with a little bit of a mischievous grin. So, where are we going to buy food for all these people to eat? St. John tells us that Jesus knew full well what he was going to do, but he was testing Philip. And Philip answers like many of us would. We don't have near enough money to feed this crowd. Andrew steps up and perhaps with a little sarcasm says, we found a boy who brought some lunch with him. Five loaves of bread and two fish. It's one of those exchanges where tone of voice, look, would tell us a lot. But one thing is certain, no one, not the disciples, not the crowd, and certainly not the boy, expects what happens next. From a meager offering, a miracle occurs. From impossibilities come possibilities. From doubt and disbelief comes dumbfounded faith and joy. And the people begin to realize that this is he whom they've been waiting for. But to read this passage from John with fresh eyes and fresh hearts is a bit difficult. For many of us, we've heard it so much. It's a Sunday school favorite, right? It's a Sunday school staple. You've got to get the flannel board out and stick the fish and the loaves on there. It's one of those miracles that gets filed under quaint, cute. Isn't that nice of Jesus to feed all those people? But there's a real spiritual message here. And there's a basic principle in reading the Gospels that we need to remember. The miracles of Jesus are never done simply as signs unto themselves, like magic tricks to impress the crowd. The miracles that Jesus does always speak to a greater reality, to tell us something more, something about God's character, of the Father's love, or of our response to that love. So as Jesus feeds these crowds, he is also teaching the apostles and us some important lessons. And because preachers use threes in all their sermons, I'm using three points today. We usually we use three. It's quite often. Lesson one. The first lesson I think we can take from this passage may surprise you, but the apostles knew it very well, and on this day they learned it again. It is this. Walk with Jesus long enough and you'll get in a jam. It's true. Walk with Jesus long enough and you'll get in a jam. Look at the gospel. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a multitude was coming to him, Jesus' ministry was growing. His reputation as a teacher and a healer was spreading. His circle of followers expanding. His faithful 12 were, well, they were being faithful. And eventually they came to a crisis. Things converged on this day. The pressure of the crowds, the lack of provision for the people, Jesus' riddle-like questions, a boy with a lunchbox. They wondered where all this was going. They may have longed for the time when it was just them and Jesus sitting around the campfire learning about God. Now here they are in a mob of 5,000 hungry people clamoring for Jesus, all wanting something. If you walk faithfully, you can rest assured that sooner or later you will find yourself in a jam. Discipleship will always bring us to places of difficult decisions Difficult conversations and choices. Why? Because we will always be at odds with the world around us. The disciple gets his or her values, goals, expectations, and standards from Jesus. And these are not the same values, goals, expectation, expectations, and standards of the world around us. At least not often. In today's lesson, Jesus suggests a walk of faith when the more practical thing would have been to dismiss the crowds, let them go into the towns and get themselves something to eat. But that was not his plan. His plan was not about the disciples' lack, but about his provision. It was not about what they could or could not do. It was about what God could do. This is a lesson we need. Authentic faith will challenge you, stretch you, and shape you. Do you think the disciples ever looked at bread and fish again the same way? 
You think they ever said, oh my gosh, how are we ever going to do it again? Probably not. Which brings me to my second lesson. Walk with Jesus and you'll learn to look to him. I love the dialogue in this passage. Everyone's expecting the dismissal, but Jesus turns to Philip and says, where can we buy enough bread that these people may eat? It's almost funny to imagine the disciples trying to figure out, is he kidding? Is he kidding or not? What did he say? But Jesus' lesson for them, particularly for Philip, runs deeper because Philip made a classic human mistake. He forgot who was asking the question. This isn't the first time the scenario of a multitude of hungry people needing bread in the wilderness occurs in Scripture. In the book of Numbers, the people of Israel cried out in hunger in the wilderness. They cried to their leader Moses, who in turn prayed to God, who provided food for his people. For Philip and the other disciples, it's the same lesson, the same test. So the second lesson from this passage is walk with Jesus. You'll get in a jam, but you'll learn to look to him. It's a lesson that we people of God today need to learn again and again. Because we forget. Philip had been with Jesus at the wedding in Cana, where he had turned water into wine. He and the other disciples had seen Jesus heal at the pool of Bethesda. And then as the crowds pressed in that day, as the disciples grew tired, their focus shifted. It's a totally human response. It happens to us. They subtly moved their eyes from Jesus to themselves. All of a sudden, it was about them, what they could not do, what they could not afford, what they could not achieve. Philip and the others forgot who it was that was standing right in front of them. They forgot who was asking the question. They were missing the answer that was standing there, the answer to the need. And I did the math, by the way, 200 denarii, it's about $14,000. That's what they figured it would take to feed those people. I figured it out with Happy Meals. It's about $20,000 if you give them a Happy Meal. I told the 9 o'clock, this is what priests do during the week. You wonder, this is it. Figure out how many Happy Meals it would take to feed the 5,000. But they missed what was right in front of them. They missed the answer that was straight in front of them. It's like the story of the customs officer who saw a truck pulling up at the border. He's suspicious and orders the driver out and searches the vehicle. He pulls off the panels, the bumpers, the fenders, but cannot find a single bit of contraband. He still suspects something is not right, but he waves the truck through. The next week, the same driver comes through. And the official searches and again finds nothing. Over the years, this same official and this same driver play this game back and forth. The official tries body searches, x-rays, sonar, anything he can think of to find what this guy is transporting. The mysterious cargo never appears. And he has no choice but every time to wave the guy on, come on in. After many years, the customs officer is set to retire. On his last day, that same driver pulls up. And the customs agent says, look, I know you're a smuggler, but I cannot figure out what you've been smuggling all these years. I'm leaving. I'm retiring. I, will, I promise I can do you no harm, but I just got to know. Please tell me what you've been smuggling. And the guy looked at him, just deadpan look, and said, trucks. <laughs> Walk with Jesus, and you'll find yourself sooner or later in a jam. Walk with Jesus and you will find that your resources are meager and insufficient for the task. You'll be tempted to try and fix it on your own. Tempted to look to yourself and not to him. Instead of trying to dip into your own empty well, sort of missing what is right in front of you, Jesus invites you to learn to look to him. Lesson three. Walk with Jesus and let him make up the difference. Often when we read the miracle of the loaves and fish, we focus on the boy who offered his lunch. His example serves as a reminder to be always willing to offer to God what we have, even if we think it isn't much. It's true. But there's more to it than that. Walk with Jesus and let him make up the difference. 
story is told of a young mother who wanted to encourage her son's piano playing. She bought tickets to hear a famous pianist. When the evening came, they found their seats on the front row of the concert hall and eyed the majestic Steinway waiting on the stage. Soon the mother found a friend to talk to, and when she wasn't paying attention, the boy slipped away. At eight o'clock, the lights began to dim. The mother turned around. Her son's not there. And then she noticed the little boy up on the bench of the Steinway, who began, and he began picking out twinkle, twinkle, little star. She gasped. Before she could retrieve her son, the master appeared on stage and moved to the keyboard. He whispered to the boy, don't quit, keep playing. Leaning over, he reached down with his left hand and began filling in a bass line. As soon as his right arm reached around the other side of the little boy and improvised a little melody to match the boy's playing. And together, the old master and the young novice mesmerized the crowd. That's what happened this day with the loaves and fishes. And in a hundred thousand other ways, it's what we will find happening in our lives as well when we walk with Jesus as his disciple. He will surround us and whisper in our ear time and time again, don't quit, keep playing. And as we do, he augments and supplements until a work of beauty is created. And we offer him what we have, as meager as we think it might be, and we allow him to make up the difference. I want to remind you, as well as myself, that difficult situations set the stage for God's work in our lives. The disciples were backed into a corner that day. Perhaps it was a little playful backing into a corner, but they were backed into a corner nonetheless. It's not comfortable, but if they hadn't been, they would never have seen God's work in that way. There have been numbers of times where the people of God had the odds stacked against them. When Nebuchadnezzar made the furnace seven times hotter before putting the servants of God into it. When Lazarus was four days in the tomb before Jesus went to him. When the Savior of the world was executed on a Roman cross. It did not look good. But as Mark Batterson put it in his book, Chase the Lion, when Jesus walked out of the tomb on the third day, the word impossible was effectively deleted from our dictionary. The miracle of the loaves and fish is at its core about seeing and following Jesus. It is about recognizing that faithfulness will lead you to difficult places. It will get you into jams you might otherwise have avoided. Following Jesus will highlight things you'd rather avoid seeing. Errors, faults, and shortcomings you'd rather stay in denial about. You will discover how limited your resources truly are, and therefore you will learn to look to Jesus, your Lord. And then you will discover a great joy because the surprise waiting for you is that he will be making up the difference, multiplying your faith, expanding your love, broadening your hope, and displaying his glory. In fact, it is in those desperate moments where we seem finally ready to call to him, to seek him, and to yield to him. So do not worry if you find yourself in a jam with limited resources. If you're confused about the next step, look to him, listen to him, trust in him. And as the piano master said to the little boy, don't quit, keep playing. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.